Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my co-host, researcher, minister, and friend, Charles Paisley. And today, we're discussing a topic that we usually don't investigate, but we have been receiving so many emails, and I've even had phone calls concerning the incident that is has happened with Mike Bickle and IHOP. And Charles, I was talking to you, and you know, briefly trying to figure out what do we do to help the people because they're I, I think I have three emails in my inbox today that's that's how this has been coming it's kind of crazy but I was talking to you Charles and you said you were being contacted as well so I thought it would be good if we just took some time out of our day and talk through what's happening and maybe give the people some encouragement because I know exactly what they're going through we went through it years ago my family we escaped January 1st, 2012, and we thought our lives was over. It, it, was, it was a really hard time. Um, I can laugh about it now because I'm, I'm on the, towards the healed side of this thing, although I still get triggered from time to time. But um, anyway, I thought it would be good if we talk about it, Charles, and um, you are the perfect person to bridge the gap between where we came from and the IHOP situation. Yeah, John. Well, it, it's uh, glad to be able to have an opportunity to chat about it, too. Yeah, I've, I've had quite a number of reach out. It's kind of surprising. I, I think they found us through um, the you know episode, I think, like 48, 49, 50 that we recorded in the podcast series where we were talking about how the message... Um, how the message influenced other groups, and um, maybe we could recap that just a little bit um, for for our listeners. If you want the full thing, you go back listen to episode forty eight, uh, forty nine, fifty, right in there, um, and you can you can get it. But um, you know, in a nutshell, um, the teachings of the Kansas City prophets are deeply influenced by the message. And where you and I come from, John, we are a, a granddaddy in a lot of ways to the ideology our, our group was, a granddaddy to the ideology that they have um, in in multiple ways. Um, the, the IHOP was started, um, I don't know exactly when the group itself came together, but there was at that time a man named Paul Kane, who was one of the most prominent of the Kansas City prophets. Well, Paul Kane was a right-hand man to William Branham from the early 1950s. And Paul Kane was continuing to preach in message churches through the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, John. So, you know, the same years that Paul Kane is, uh, is, is going to the Toronto Blessing conferences, going to the Vineyard Movement conferences, going to uh, doing all of his stuff with the Kansas City Prophets, the exact same years that he's doing that, Paul Kane's still coming around the message churches. I mean, I think it was the early 2000s for sure was the last time he was at Tucson Tabernacle, for example. So we, we were with Paul Kane in the same years that he was launching the third wave of Pentecostalism in that sense when he was in the message. So the ideology that they have, I just, I really think they don't know a lot of them where it came from, okay? They have a, they have a flavor of the latter rain movement that's deeply impacted by, um, the influence of William Branham on Paul Kane. Um, and so, anyways, Bob Jones, who I believe is kind of the guy who started IHOP, uh, before Mike Bickle kind of took charge. He was also deeply influenced by Latter Rain, um, with, with a lot of the exact same ideology. And the truth is, if you just take the name William Branham and you kind of lower him down a few notches from, you know, maybe back him away from being Messiah, maybe come a little bit lower than Elijah, right? <laughs> If you make William Brown a little less than Elijah, then our ideology is is very highly compatible with with uh, what they believe at, at, at you know in those places and and so much of it similar. Like you take Bill Hammond, um, he created what the the um, what do they call that the the Elijah class or the Elijah? It's not like the Elijah school, but it's like a an Elijah group of prophets, like the Elijah school of prophets. And so, uh, and so much of it is just so deeply based on what you find in the message. And so, just from an ideological standpoint, I think that we very strongly relate to just the basic beliefs of the Kansas City prophecy. 
Yeah, I would agree. <clears throat> I'm getting a lot of that, you know, and Elijah's not the only name. They w- One person was emailing me. There's all kinds of variations on it, like the new Malachi Ministries. I'm not going to give the names of these organizations, but they're using words like Malachi and Elijah. And essentially what they have, and, and actually one person, <laughs> they've done their homework at this point. They've escaped and they've done their homework. But they were pointing out that this was all the manifested sons of God framework that these all of these entities are built upon. So I'm getting some of that and people are actually diving into the research and they're getting the history and they they were aware that William Branham and the latter rain movement was sort of a grandfather to what they came from, maybe a great grandfather to what they came from. They weren't aware that many of the doctrines were so prevalent in the latter rain movement. And so many of these new guys, they're they're claiming these new spiritual revelations. And as they're going to table.branham.org, which is the transcripts for William Branham, they're starting to realize, wait a minute, <laughs> these guys are just copying <laughs> bad theology from William Branham. And, mm-hmm. and then they, they've taken it a step further and they found out from our work from the podcast and some of the research you have on your website and mine that not only is it bad theology, there's a large amount of fiction and um, we, we've been going through the the connections to mysticism with Steve Montgomery and they're, <laughs> they're learning that, wait a minute, this isn't even Christianity. What was this thing I came from? So I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of that, but I'm also getting, there are people who were either abused or got very were were very fortunate they did not get abused because their peer group were getting abused by the situation and uh, I'm not going to take sides in it because (laughs) for Christian organizations all of these groups seem to be very happy to fling lawsuits so I'm just going to say that there are some accusations (laughs) And uh, I think everybody is aware of what's going on. If you go out to the news, you can see there are some some sexual misconduct accusations that have been going around. And uh, so I'm getting the group of the people who are looking into the history, but I'm also getting people who are starting to realize that there is a repetitive, reoccurring situation where people are being physically, sexually, spiritually abused in, in all of this. And I, I actually was on the phone. I'm, I can't give the people's name, obviously, but I was on the phone for, gosh, it was like one to two hours talking to somebody. And <clears throat> they were talking about it, and the thought just suddenly struck them. The biblical aspect of this is, by their fruits you will know them. And they can see this, this same fruit recurring and over and over and over. And, you know, in the end, the person finally said to me, what was this? This wasn't Christianity. He said something to that effect. What was this? This wasn't Christianity. And we we got to talking. And <clears throat> anyway, I think it would be good if we were to just go over a little bit about what this was for people who haven't yet done that research, because like I say, I'm, <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting emails from this. And I'm also getting, Charles, I don't know if you've been getting this, but in the months before this happened, I was actually, I started getting contacted by people connected to the ministry. And it was very odd because it, they were very clearly fishing. And by that, I mean, they were saying things and not giving me enough information to talk through it. And they were looking to see what I would say, probably wondering how much I already knew. And I'm not going to tell them that, so <laughs> I just I kind of let it go. I answered very simply, and I, I want to say I was contacted at least, gosh, I want to say it was at least seven to ten times by people who are connected to this, and this is before the news broke out, so you could tell something bad was brewing, and uh, at that point in time, I didn't want to say whether I knew or not, but I will say now that I can understand why they're contacting me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, John, it, 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 it's something else, just how all this stuff unfolds. You know, we we did, what, a 70-episode podcast kind of on the history of the message. And, hey, if you guys are in the uh, 
Kansas City prophets, the history of the message is the history of your movement because uh, your ideology has the same roots. Right? You're, you're, you are a branch of the Latter Rain movement, which is uh, descended from the British Israelite branch of Pentecostalism. Okay, That is where your Elijah beliefs come from. It's the fusion of British Israelism into Pentecostalism um, from the late 1800s and then, uh, you know, John Dowie to the the Foursquare side is where a lot of that pooled into the Foursquare denomination was kind of a home to the British Israelite ideology um, coming up into the 40s. Then as you come into the 50s, it just all kind of got booted out of there and ended up in the Latter Rain movement, uh, which then eventually produced the message. It produced a lot of other movements, too. It produced the walk. It produced the move. It produced... Um, just quite a number of different groups besides the message. Um, and then, uh, of course, Paul Kane, uh, through his influence, a lot of that was, was carried on into, yeah, the, the Kansas City Prophets. Let me point real quick to a book to people. This is a wonderful book called The New Charismatics by Michael Moriarty. I would highly recommend looking into this book. This is going to give you, if you're from the Kansas City Prophets types, a good history of where this, where your ideology came from. This is wrote in the 90s, right when your movement was kicking off. And the people that knew what was happening then wrote this book, and it, it's very good in that way. And I know, um, you know, what, what probably close to a year ago, John, we recorded our episodes talking about the influence of the message in Latter Rain into the Kansas City Prophets. And when we did that at the time, you know, we noted we don't really know anybody personally in, in the Kansas City Prophets, you know, other than, you know, our limited interactions with Paul Kane when he was in message churches or reaching out to us, we really never had any direct connection to them. And so we didn't have too much to say other than we just pointed out we were very concerned for them, right? I mean, um, they have all, all of the, that ideology contains everything you need to produce a destructive cult, right? It has within positive confession, it has the brainwashing thought control techniques. That's what positive confession is. It's training yourself to believe something that's not true. So with the positive confession, you have the just the core framework of the thought control uh, that you need to produce a cult. Then after that, um, you know, the, the next notable thing they have is they have the uh, fivefold ministry, right? And the fivefold ministry gives you an authoritarian, unaccountable leadership model, right? So now you've got two of the critical pillars for a cult. You've got an authoritarian leadership model, and you also have a... Um, a uh, thought control, okay? Now you combine that with the third piece, right? You're chasing manifested sons of God. So now you've got your carrot on the stick. That's the third thing you need to produce a destructive cult. So you've got authoritarian control, brainwashing, mind control, and you're chasing a carrot. And within that framework, um, horrors, horrors can ensue. And that is what we have seen everywhere this ideology has went, quite frankly. Whether you look in the walk, whether you look in the move, whether you look in the message, whether you look in the way, and hey, they all got catchy names, right? <laughs> but but the, everywhere it goes, it produces horrors. It produces horrors. And, um, and of course, we don't know what's going on, you know, behind the, the, the closed doors at IHOP, but... Everything is there to produce the horrors, and yeah, it sounds like it's really um, coming out into the open here lately. And and here's what I know, John, and um, so uh, we know, of course, John, you and I know that Paul Kane. you know, we know, going back to the early days of the message, when Paul Kane was still with William Branham, you know, part of his inner circle at times, Paul Kane moved to Arizona at the same time that the Deity cult relocated to Arizona as well. And we know in that period of time, there was tortures and molestations of children and horrible things happening in the park um, from the mid and late 60s um, at that period. Um, Paul Kane moved there at that time. We don't know directly how much he was related to those things, uh, but you know we've documented how there were a lot of homosexuals in William Branham's inner circle, Paul Kane being one of those homosexuals. Um, and then he went into hiding, more or less. He disappeared when William Branham died. Not precisely sure why. Um, I've heard different stories, but I've, I'm not really sure what happened. He just disappeared and William Branham died. He resurfaces, and when he resurfaces, he resurfaces with Bob Jones and the Kansas City Prophets. Now, Bob Jones, who started that group, he did the same thing. He ended up in trouble, I want to say, in the early, about 1992. He ended up in trouble with, uh, you know, sexual misconduct uh, with people in his church. In 1992, he's passed away now, Bob Jones. And he ends up succeeded by, um, and th they were working with John Wimber at that point, right? They were still, they were in 
with the vineyard movement and all that. And I think John Wimber is the one who uncovered Bob Jones's uh, sexual misconduct in the early 90s. So he ends up, you know, pushed out and stepped down. But it, it seems like now the whole thing behind the scenes the whole time was always just some sort of a weird sex thing going on there. And it seems it's reported now that, again, we don't know firsthand. It's just reported, right, that Mike Bickle was having relations with children as young as 14 years old, um, almost that far back, right? And so you've got Paul Kane, a, you know... His sexual misconduct. You got Bob Jones, his sexual misconduct. You've got Mike Bickle, his sexual misconduct. So the key Kansas City prophets are all sex perverts. <laughs> and that is who is running this, running this movement. Of course, it's all behind the covers, but now it starts to come to light. And the witnesses that have contacted me, uh, the word grooming was used, which is something that um, I, th I think that was the Naomi Wright series of videos that we did. Um, we had the you know, the free and clear show dot com. We had the free and clear podcast episodes I did with Naomi and you and I interviewed Naomi and she was talking about women being groomed in the Branham cults. <clears throat> and I think that struck home with a few of the ladies who were connected to whatever was happening. Again, I'm not going to say that it did or didn't happen because <laughs> these, these groups are lawsuit happy. And um, it it just goes to show even that even the fact that I have to say that shows that there's something wrong here. This is not true Christianity. True Christianity doesn't fling lawsuits over things like this. They try to make, you know, there's some accountability. They try to make it right. <clears throat> but one of the resources that would be really helpful for people who are escaping this is freedomofmind.org. And you can look through Dr. Stephen Hassan's um, descriptions of what makes a destructive cult. <clears throat> because What's interesting about a cult, and I've worked with several different splinter groups of the message and even groups that weren't even connected to the message at this point, and each one will have their outlandish belief that they will stick to, some of them even after escaping the cult, they'll still believe it because they have been hardwired and programmed in the mind to believe it. And other people in other sects or cults will look at that same belief and they'll say, well, that's nonsense. How can you believe that? While they have something different <laughs> that they believe that, you know, group A doesn't understand that. And um, Dr. Stephen Hassan <clears throat> has the bite model. It's, it's all about controlling your behavior, controlling and manipulating the information and thought control, thought manipulation, thought reform. Um, emotional control they love to tug at your emotions in these groups they love it because if they can tug at your emotions they can draw you into the rest of the other attributes <clears throat> but they like i said one group will misunderstand won't believe the other group's weird thing whatever is the thing that they've been taught and what's interesting about ihop is with paul kane being connected to it if you go back and study the history of Paul Kane, not only is he in this deity thing, you can go to YouTube and you can type in the name Ronald Coyne or uh, Boy with the Plastic Eye, and you can see Paul Kane traveling with this, <laughs> this road show where a boy has one good eye and one plastic eye, and he's claiming that God has given them a power to see through his plastic eye. And they put, you know, they cover his eye up. And again, these people are so happy. I'm not going to say it's true or not, but I have heard people, witnesses who were <laughs> involved with watching what was happening. And, you know, if you cover your plastic eye, you know, you looking straight at me, it looks like it's covered. But if I've got a little gap right here, I can see pretty much everything. And... Uh, I'm told, and again, I'm not <laughs> not going to say it happened because I don't want to be sued, but I'm told that Paul Kane and Ronald Coyne were aware that they had been called out on the, <laughs> the gap between the eyes. So long story short, they had a magician's trick, and that's the kind of religion that this whole thing is. They love to have a gimmick. They love to have a magician's trick. If they can trick you, and they can apply the bite model, behavioral control, information, thought control, emotional control. That combination will suck you in and 
rewire your brain where you are trapped in this thing mentally and then this escaping that mental those mental chains that they put around you is very very difficult yeah i i think that's one of the the most important thing to do when you you come out of a group like this you know and if, if you're waking up is to is to understand how they did this to you how how did they how did they pull this off how did they trick you right how did they get you to surrender um, your free will to them almost, you know, how did they do this, right? And understanding how they pulled that off is so important to keep you from being able to fall back into the same thing again, right? I mean, uh, one of the biggest risks you have coming out of a group like this is that you're going to say, well, my, it was just my leaders. They were just corrupt. Oh, it was just Paul Kane. Oh, it was just Bob Jones. Oh, it was just Mike Bickle, and what happened? They went from Paul Kane to Bob Jones, and Bob Jones, to you know, they keep re-victimizing, right? But you gotta, you wake, you gotta wake up and realize, no, wait a minute, right? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. A minute. I need to like rethink this whole thing. How did they do this to my mind, and not go jump in bed with another person doing the exact same thing to your mind, right? You need to, you know, wake up, realize the framework that enabled this. And escape that framework, right? Don't just go find a new person preaching something similar to what you heard without actually taking the time to kind of reanalyze it all and figure out how you got into that, got into that mess to begin with, right? I mean, don't, don't leave one authoritarian structure and go to another. Don't leave one mind control cult and go to another. Don't leave, you know, uh, chasing the manifested sons of God carrot here and go chase it somewhere else. You want to get away from that. Break, break that cycle. Figure out what it was, right? Um, and that's going to enable you then to be able to find something healthy. And I think one of the most important things to do is you got to, I know where we come from, you got to turn off the tapes. <laughs> <laughs> you got to stop listening to them, right? Turn off the tape. Do not listen. They ha they know how to push the buttons. They know how to, they may not even know what they're doing, but they are masters of thought control, right? And they've, and you've been in there a long time. You're programmed. You've got to, Get away from that thing. Quit listening to it, right? And try to figure out how they did that to you so that you can keep that from happening to you again. Yeah, and I think the best advice that I can give having gone through it is simply learning from the mistakes that I've made. Because <laughs> whenever I left this cult, I, it was messy. It was really, really messy. Because I left it sort of not even of my own my own doing I <clears throat> I was just simply asking some questions and they kicked me out and I was really I was trying to prove was William Branham true was he a true prophet and you could tell by the <laughs> the lack of accountability for the questions that that there was a problem there and it I, I was kind of thrown into this right and being thrown into it I truly wanted to help other people and that's the number one thing that happens for any of the groups, any of the people that I've worked with who have escaped a cult. After you realize that you have been bruised, oppressed, spiritually abused, sometimes sexually, physically abused, there's this instant thought, well, I need to help other people because other people are, ha are going through the same thing. And they they'll instantly try to do it but the problem is if they don't take time to heal themselves it gets really messy and i can say <laughs> you can look back on my history i can i can tell you that from my own experience it gets messy you need to take some time to heal yourself now there are cases i understand where you have to dive in and help i'm not saying don't do that but when you have the opportunity get the help that you need these people i don't know how it is in the ihop i know in the sect of the message that I was in, it was that way. But these people are strongly against any form of therapist. They they do not want you going to a psychologist, a therapist, a counselor, a psychoanalyst, um, psycho, psychotherapist, any of these different professions, because many times these professions will detect that you're in a cult and then they will try to get you out. So they want to put up a barrier where you're, where you're not doing that and they'll put a mental barrier. Often you'll find that there will be approved counselors. You can go to this set of counselors, but don't go to these others because they, they're not Christian they're, or they're not the same kind of Christian. And do you do this with a doctor? If you, if you need to, doc, to go to a doctor, I've been to, I've been to everywhere from 
Muslim doctors to Christian doctors to atheist doctors and who who delivers my shot I really don't care as long as I'm getting the shot so my advice is if you need therapy go to a therapist now if you're if you're remaining Christian it is good to get a Christian therapist I'm not I'm not saying that's bad at all, but oft times you'll find that some of the Christian therapists do not understand cults, and I've even seen from our own support groups, this is another thing that we've experienced, sometimes the people who have been bruised by Christian ministers have an incompatibility with a Christian therapist because the therapists themselves are triggering them as they leave. And so sometimes it's better to step away, get healed, and then go to a Christian therapist if, if that's where you're headed. So my, my advice is don't make the mistakes that I did. <laughs> get healed you know, before you go out and try to help people. And <clears throat> try to you, – you will find if you're in one of these destructive groups, you'll find that there's a deep level of indoctrination that you're not aware even happened. And – Five years from now, you'll say, wow, I was so much different then. And five years from now, you may still have some of that pro effects of that programming in your head or even still some of the programming. And then 10 years, you'll say, wow, five years ago, I was still programmed. <laughs> That's exactly what happened to me and many of the people that I'm working with. So it's a progression of time. What I did, and I can truly recommend this if you remain Christian, one of the things that I did was I read the Bible cover to cover, and I lost count <clears throat> between 10 and 15 times, but I, I tried to read it for what it said, not for what I had been told that it was said. Exactly what does it say? Read nothing else into it, not even reading. You know, people have this habit of reading, say, the gospel by reading it and thinking about another gospel. And the problem with doing this is many times you've been told what that other gospel says, and it may not even say it. <clears throat> I read the text for what it said, nothing more, nothing less, and just went cover to cover over and over and over. And after about five times, I was, I was like, this is a different book, man. This is not even the same book that I had when I was in the cult. And all I'm doing is just reading what it said. I know for me, when, when I left John and, Maybe this is kind of a personal thing. I don't know if it's no good. We can cut it out. <laughs> but I, I know for me, when, when I left, you know, like the hardest, the hardest thing is it, with with the message indoctrination, and it's probably I, I should expect it similar here. Is you know, you you believe you can't make it without the present truth, you right? Without the message for your hour, right? What, and you you believe that these um, leaders, this fivefold ministry, right, are the dispensers of that. And you, you really, in your mind, even though it might not be something you ever, is ever emphatically stated or explicitly stated, you hold the belief that you cannot make it without these leaders and without this ideology that they're giving you. Like you, you believe that in yourself. At some base level, you believe that. And that produces just so much, um, fear. It produces so much control over you. And finding a way to break that is so important. And, you know, I, I came to the point, um, so John, I, I had, was out of the cult for several months before I, you know, I could even let myself, you know, think the four letter word that it was a cult, right? I think I was out six months before I could even say, you know, our prophet had been a false prophet, right? Like it, it, you know, you, you, your mind, the mind control is so strong, right? You, like you almost can't even allow yourself to begin those thought patterns. And, uh, but, you know, coming to realize that, um, there is not, there's, there's no one else that saves you but Jesus, right? I mean, <laughs> Jesus is it. You don't need, you don't need your cult leader. You don't need that guy in the middle that's up there dispensing the present truth to you. You don't need that, right? They've tricked you. They've tricked you. They've, they've made themselves your savior, right? And that's the first, if you can throw that one away, that's one way to break the indoctrination. You don't need them to make it, right? You don't. They, they've tricked you into thinking you need them to make it. And then the whole present truth thing, right? That's really just a Gnostic idea that you're saved by understanding mysteries or understanding knowledge, which again is not biblical Christianity, right? Biblical Christianity is you're saved by faith in Christ. So they have, they have, without often explicitly stating it, they have, um, bastardize the gospel. 
you know, into inserting themselves as your savior in some role, and also um, making you think in some way these mysteries or whatever they're teaching you is necessary for your salvation rather than simple faith in Christ. And so from a, just a purely um, Christian aspect, realizing that they have hijacked and destroyed those things um, can give you the freedom to then go look and consider something else, I think. So. Yeah, there's a reason why these are called high demand groups. <clears throat> they they demand especially mentally, they they demand your thoughts at all time. You have to be thinking and they they create this urgency. It's very urgent that you whatever you call <laughs> in your group this revelation, this present truth, you know, they even name their organizations after this, which is absurd when you really break it down, but they want this false urgency so that they can keep you contained. If they can keep your mind focused on urgency, you're not thinking critically, you're not thinking logically, and you're really not thinking about what happens if you leave the group, because there's never going to be a need to leave the group. It's urgent. There's an urgent, sudden and impending doom coming, and you have to be in this group, right? <clears throat> I don't care what flavor of the cult or what you know, we're talking about the IHOP group, and that is a somewhat of a descendant from William Branham in the latter reign. Well, even if it wasn't connected to this, the way a cult works is the same way. It's, it's almost like a cookie-cutter framework of how to create a destructive cult. They want to keep your mind captive, and if they can keep you, your mind captive with the urgency, they have you in their grasp, and you can't get out of it. So... What happens is when you leave it, you leave the high demand group with the same urgency. And so people are scrambling. The, I'll, I'll guarantee if I, I haven't read all of the emails that I got today, I still have to go through them. But I guarantee every single one of them is exactly like the person who I talk with on the phone. Where do I go from here? What do I do next? There's an urgency, right? <clears throat> because they've programmed you to be that way. And in the end, when you leave, you have to somehow rewire that first. That's the first thing that you address. It's not urgent. Go and find a place. First, you have to heal. But once you heal, then you have to find who, who is your identity because you've taken on the cult identity. You have to deconstruct that and find yourself and find, you know, this, <laughs> the person who called me, they're asking, well, what, you know, what church group do I go to denomination? It's a question I never answer because every single person is different. But what I do say is try a few of them. It's not urgent. Go, you know, go to one church. If this isn't for you, find out why, but before you, before you leave it, find out what you liked about it. Because the other thing that I've learned, which we weren't allowed to, is I can go to any group. I don't care who they are. I, we, were, we were indoctrinated heavily against Catholicism. I've not been to a Catholic church, but I guarantee you I could go to a Catholic church because I have Catholic friends who are in the Catholic church, and I can learn something from the Catholic church. I'm not going to agree with it because I'm not Catholic. I'll probably never be Catholic, but I can learn something from them. And it doesn't hurt you. It's not urgent. Go learn whatever the group that you're going into. Go learn what you like about it. Learn what you dislike. And then critically think about why you don't like it. Critically think about why you did like the other thing. So that when you go to try out the next church, you can find a fit for you. And that's literally what you're doing. You're trying to find your place, your footing in this world. And it's a journey. It's, it's a journey that you're not going to make immediately. I know for myself, <laughs> there was a period of time when changes were coming so rapidly, I was deconstructing my cult identity, and with it I was deconstructing all of the false doctrine. And I found that this doctrine was built on this other doctrine, which was built on this other doctrine. And the deeper I dug, I would find false doctrine but there would be a whole stack of other doctrines built on the false doctrine. And when you take down the one at the bottom, the, <laughs> the whole top comes crumbling down, right? <clears throat> and so it got to the point where things were changing so rapidly that what I believed one week wasn't even the same as what I believed the next week because I had just taken out, deconstructed entire frameworks of doctrines. 
And I think you'll find that after you leave one of these high demand groups, you'll find the same kind of thing. It some people it's really fast. I, I took it somewhat slow. I would say there was a period of about maybe six to seven years where I was really just deconstructing slowly and slowly trying to reconstruct, but not, you know, I, I'm I'm a lot slower than a lot of the people I'm working with in the support groups in that I am still at the very early stages of reconstruction. I have broken everything down. I've taken pretty much everything away that is completely false doctrine. And I just started with something that I knew was personal to me. And then I built, started building on top of that. And I started building up what I believe. And I think that that's the best advice I can give. It's not urgent. Just, um, you know, take your time, learn, get your footing, get solid footing and move forward. That, that's great advice, John. That That is so good because, you know, when I had left, I mean, I, I, I started, I don't know, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm maybe an odd duck, but I would quote, I just read in my mind over and over again, John 14 again, you know, let not your heart be troubled. And really the whole point of that, you know, letting up your heart be troubled, Jesus is saying, you got me, you got enough. You'll figure the rest out. It's going to be okay, right? Like that's, that's really the whole point that Jesus really is making through there. You got, you, you, you got the basics, you got your savior, you're going to be fine. And the rest is all going to work out, you know, with time. Um, I, I like too what you said there about, you know, the urgency that the leaders try to create, you know, the, one thing I am almost 100% sure that the uh, the IHOP people are chasing is they're chasing the Last Day Revival, right? Um, now, we know all about that, John, too, didn't we? Because we were chasing the Last <laughs> Day Revival, too, weren't we? Why? Because we're the same ideology, right? And just like the latter rains, chasing the Last Day Revival. And it's always right around the corner. The revival is about to be here. And you better not miss service next week. You might miss it, right? And whatever this thing is, you know, you're chasing it and chasing it and chasing it. And guess what? You know, all the people who came up with that idea to chase the revival, they're all dead. <laughs> it never came, right? <laughs> uh, the, then the founders of the message are almost all dead. And it never came, right? It's not this thing. I mean, it is not. it was always going to happen next week. You know, it's always just a month or two or three away. It's always just around the corner. But it never comes, right? And they, and they keep you on the edge of your seat week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, decade in, decade out, and it never comes, okay? What in the world, right? At a certain point, you know, you can start to wake up and realize this thing is never coming, right? And maybe it is, but hey, these guys have no idea when because they've been wrong the last 50 times, right? What makes you think they're going to be right the next time, right? So, you know, chasing that they they just they got you fooled it it they got you fooled right and at the end of the day it's not the last day revival that's going to save anybody i mean if you want my opinion right it's just jesus is going to save you right so you're chasing something that you really don't need to make it honestly um hey who loves everyone loves a good revival right i'm sure if everyone's a christian they love a good revival but you know, last day revival, the, you know, hey, what if you're in the hospital that day? You think Jesus is going to leave you behind? I don't think so, right? Like, it don't work that way. Um, so, anyways, that, that's, that, that'd be another thing I would throw in there, John. And, and yeah, we're all chasing the same revival, right? And where do you guys think you learned that from at IHOP? <laughs> You learned, it. you learned it from the people from the message, Paul Kane and the other Lateran guys. That's where this stuff comes from. You know, people have chased the revival long before even, <laughs> so we were in the grandfather or great-grandfather to this thing. You can go back through history and you can find them chasing the revival decades, centuries in the past. They're always doing this, man. And it's always a destructive cult that's doing it time after time after time. <clears throat> I actually don't even, I know very little about Mike Bickle because my research starts about 1970-ish and then goes backwards through time. I, once I realized that the fruit of the tree was bad, 
I got disinterested in looking at the new ministries that sprung up after this, because I can tell you exactly the fruit they're going to produce. (laughs) And I can look at it all the way back through time. You can go all the way back to Gnosticism, and you can see the same fruit being produced from Gnosticism and Jewish mysticism all the way into these latter rain guys. Steve Montgomery, if you haven't checked out our Converging Apostasy podcast series, check it out because he is he's bringing together how all of that merged to create basically the new apostolic reformation today but it came through the latter rain it came through ihop and all of these guys but it's the same fruit over and over and over and they use the same strategy over and over and over it's urgent the revival's coming there's no need to give me all your money you don't need all your money because we're going to have the the end of days revival we're going to have the rapture whatever the group calls it and in the end that's the common framework for all of it. Give me your money. Right. And you know, what, what's so ironic is all of these guys are always trotting it out. I just got this in a divine revelation from God, right? This is fresh manna from heaven. <laughs> no, it's not. It, it is recycled, the same recycled trash for the last 500 years. You know, I mean, it is not, right? It is not. It just, it, and it, and it you know, it, it kind of the point, it, you know, it, it really burns me, you know, to hear the people doing this sort of stuff. Because it is not, right? Not only can we find the ideology repeated over and over and over and over and over again, we can actually connect the dots between person to person to person to person to person to show how it moved down. This wasn't no angels coming down whispering stuff in nobody's ears. This wasn't divine revelations from God. These are people copying stuff they heard and learned from other people and recycling it and regurgitating it over and over and over. And you're right, John, we don't have time to walk through it all you know, in this episode, but you go back to the 1700s with Jane Lead and the revival of Gnosticism. She had the last day revival stuff and how it was going to bring in the manifested sons of God. You go read it. She, her followers melded in with Joanna Southcott and the British Israelites in the 1800s, right? The British Israelites, John Alexander Dowie was British Israelite. It ends up down with him. It melds into early Pentecostalism with the British Israelites coming into early Pentecostalism. John Lake, Charles Parham, um, Gordon Lindsay, were the British Israelites from that same branch, right? They pass it on down into the message of William Branham. They pass it into the Latter Rain movement. The early Latter Rain leaders were British Israelite. You know, uh, George Houghton was British Israelite. And so they pull these ideas in. And then, of course, in that generation, they drop the actual British Israelism itself. But they keep the crazy Last Day Revival stuff that they're chasing. And then it pours into the message. And then from there, it pours in, you know, to... Kansas City Prophets, it pours into the third wave of Pentecostalism, into all of that stuff. This is the same ideology. The dots fully connect from every person, one to the next. And you can go back and look at every iteration of this ideology, all the way back to the 1700s. Um, and I know with, um, with, uh, with, um, uh, you know, Steve Montgomery, he's even got some traces of it back into the 1600s. Um, and the late 1500s, you know, through a few more dots connecting further back, which is incredibly interesting. But it, it's just the same ideology iterating and iterating and iterating and evolving and evolving. And with each, gen- each generation, yeah, they have their Brownsville revival. They have their Toronto blessing. They have their latter reign, right? There is something that happens over and over, but it never brings them the thing they're looking for. And it just sets them up on this continual chasing. And what they're looking for never actually comes because at the end of the day i have to say it's not really christianity it's just crazy gnostic ideas that's never going to actually bring anything to fruition right um you know hey you, you want my christian opinion you know believe jesus and throw all that nonsense away <laughs> yeah <laughs> and not just gnosticism and mysticism steve has taken it he's opened up my eyes to this but you can go you can go to Aleister crowley who is one of the notorious devil worshipers they call them of the you know of the days gone by not a good figure not the man that you would want running your church i'll just put it like that you can (laughs) you can go up on the web and you can look up who is alistair crowley and you you can see it but some of his ideology you can find even in william branham's message and going forward similarities between the two because it's not a christian doctrine you know i'm not going to say that william branham studied Aleister Crowley and stole his doctrine and plagiarized it because I don't know where he got it, but it is the same thing in many cases. 
and we're throwing out names and terms and the thought just struck me charles because <laughs> when i was talking to the on the phone to this guy he he was shocked because apparently this god's generals book the all of these people read it as like it's a second bible or something this is <laughs> the, <laughs> these are the fathers of our faith oh, and boy. um he had he had just discovered that this is a book of fairy tales and i guess we should probably throw out that all of these <laughs> names that we've mentioned these guys will tell you what each person claimed about themselves they're not even going to tell you whether it's true what they claimed but they're going to tell you this man was god's general because he claimed he could do this and this other man was god's general because he claimed or she claimed she could do this other thing they're not going to give you the critical information and all of these names that we've mentioned the thought just suddenly struck me there's probably people indoctrinated to think that <laughs> these are good names <laughs> and just go look them up. You'll be surprised what you see. We've got I, – I started keeping tally of all the weird things, but we've got – some of these people believe that you could sell <laughs> sell people this little seal, and if you got the seal, you're going into heaven, you're, you're saved. To this other guy had – Charles Parham, the founder of the Pentecostal faith – he was caught in the scandal where they had this this little elixir that you could pour on rocks and turn ordinary rocks into gold. And he thought he was going to get the Ark of the Covenant, and he was selling <laughs> selling tickets to go get it. And I mean, these guys are not what you think. I'm just going to say it like that. These guys are not what you think. And if you were watching a fantasy movie, it would be a really entertaining movie because these guys are many of them are buffoons and you can watch the buffoonery and you can kind of laugh at it when you're disconnected from it but when you're indoctrinated to think that our faith came from this and these are heroes of the faith it's it's painful and i remember going through that because we i didn't have that same lineage we didn't believe most of this god's general stuff but there were men that I truly believed and respected and thought were Christian founders of the faith. And I realized that, no, these guys are scoundrels. And learning that was very painful. So I know I'm laughing about this. If you came out of this and you're a God's Generals fan, then probably I shouldn't be laughing, and I apologize. It, it's it, it's going to be tough if you've been trained to believe that. Yeah, just go slow. Don't... Uh... Don't don't absorb too much of it at once and just take your time. Pace yourself and just study out the history. Hey, our podcast is a great place to start for that too, huh, John? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we'll put in a shameless plug there. How about that? Uh, but yeah, I mean, th th there's so much there. And you, you're right, John. I mean, the truth is when you, when you go through the stream of people, hey, I'm not talking about all the Pentecostalism. I'm not talking about all the charismatic. I'm not talking about everybody, right? But when you trace the people who are the key shakers and move, movers in this ideology, in this branch of, of this ideology that, you know, embedded itself into Pentecostalism, that embedded itself into the charismatic movement, you're going to find that you can go back 200 years worth and they are thieves, killers, child molesters. Deceivers, you know, jailbait. I mean, there you go down the list. Uh, rapists, um, you know, it, it's, it is, and almost every last one of them. Almost every last one of them. I mean, whether it's John Sanford, whether it's Char John Lake, whether it's Alexander Dowie, you know, it, it's almost every last one of them was this way. It's unbelievable, right? There, there, you, 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 it, it is hard to find a clean one in the bunch, right? And, you know, I know, uh, <laughs> I, I know the message, you know, kind of response to that be, well, you know, uh, they accused Peter and Paul of all this stuff and it's all just made up. And, uh, <laughs> give me a break. I mean, these people, it is true though. It really is true. They really did do all of this stuff, right? It was not false accusations. You know, you, so it, it's just something else. And, and you people at IHOP and, and these other places that are experiencing this firsthand, don't think it's all just a trick of the devil. It is not a trick of the devil. It's if, if if anything, it's hey, it's God giving you a chance to wake up and see what's behind the curtain. And so, uh, don't press play on the tape anymore, <laughs> and go listen. You know, get away from that influence and, and try to find a way to, to listen to something that's going to wake your mind up. Yeah, and I think I'm going to give a a uh, 
negative review of our podcast for people who have escaped this. <clears throat> I know Charles <laughs> gave a plug for it, but this has grown so much what we're doing on william branhamorg <clears throat> We have the podcast is split actually into multiple series at this point, and we have testimony series, which may be helpful for people who have escaped this, but we're starting a new series called Weaponized Religion, and we're going back to some of the terms that Charles has mentioned in this episode, the British Israelism. Um, we're also going into the Christian identity side, the political side, and I'm, I'm going to say right now, it's probably not a good place for you to start because that would be excessively painful to learn that the, this thing has roots in the white supremacy organizations, the Ku Klux Klan. It's connected to the Nazis. It's connected <laughs> connected almost, well, actually directly to Hitler in, in one instance. It, it would be painful to start there. So I'm going to say if you're are che- if you are checking out the podcast, go look at the Revival History series that we did, and that's probably the best place to start and get a feel for that before you dive into Nazis and Klan and all of the stuff that you really don't want to know <laughs> as the great-grandfather of where your movement came from. Yeah, that, that's a good... Uh some good advice there, John. Yeah. And I think it, it, it's pretty good. Well, there's what, 70 episodes or so. We, and we, we start, you know, it probably starts from the late 1800s and traces the, the, the movement up into the sixties. So, um, and, uh, yeah, Paul Kane gets mentions in there and, and a few other people that, uh, would uh, probably be remembered by the people around Kansas city prophets. So take it slow. You know, critically think about everything and don't trust anything that you think that you believe. That's, I think, honestly, that's the best advice I could give because what they have trained you to believe may not actually be in the Bible or it may be slightly twisted so that it sounds like it's in the Bible and maybe halfway is, but it's so far out of context that it doesn't really fit. Just relearn for yourself and critically think about how you're learning. Take it slow. There is no urgency. Uh, The other thing that I did not mention is a lot of these high-demand groups, they're very close-knit, and whenever you're in a group where everyone is just in your face, when you leave that group, there is this sudden feeling of loneliness because now (laughs) you go to a new church that isn't destructive, Everybody's not in your face, and oddly, you want everybody to be in your face when you've been in one of these groups, which is odd. It's, I remember going through that feeling, and there's just void that you, you feel like you're, you know, you feel like you're lonely and sad, and that's a normal feeling. It's, a normal, it's normal to go through that experience. That's painful. Take some time. Heal. Go through that and learn that it's not healthy for everybody to be in everybody's business <laughs> like they are in a cult. So I think that's the last piece of advice that I'll give. And hopefully we've said something that can help the people. And, you know, feel free to continue contacting me. I, uh, I will answer these emails that I haven't today. And <clears throat> we I'm certain we'll get more. So don't feel like it will stop. But I thought we would put this out there for all of the people who are desperately seeking help. And if you've enjoyed this show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org and christiangospelchurch.org. For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the healing revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. <laughs> <laughs>